Hello friends, this is Self-Critical Automaton, Aberdeen's third most sleepiest YouTuber, and today it's time for more Dishonored Let's Play. I am recording this immediately after the last episode, which means that the uh, tragic fact of my incredible sleepiness is still maintained. I am very, very tired, and um, low-key losing my brain a little bit. So I want to pick up exactly where we left off by talking about this lovely vista. The views of the city from the river are really consistent and really endearing. They're often very lovely views of the city, but they also, as I've talked about before, show you exactly where you are. Different parts of the city can be recognised in the backdrop. For example, this central island in the river um, can be used as a landmark to tell where you are. This broken bridge is a very important landmark, and that over there? That tower is actually where we'll be going for the next chapter of the game. Or, no, I tell a lie. The chapter after next. So, I can tell from this that we are on the same side of the river as the Handpits pub, because that tower is visible from the Handpits. So is this broken bridge. This broken bridge can be seen upriver from the Handpits. Well, that implies to me that the Handpits is down that way. But you can actually plot these locations... Um, in like spatial reference to one another and the entire city does make sense as a physical location. Uh, there is a there are a few bends in the river which is why we can't necessarily see everything but uh, that broken bridge is visible from the Hound Pits pub as is the tower which is visible to you know the left hand side so that would imply actually that the Hound Pits pub is on the other side of this bend in the river over that way. So yeah, that's just a nice little touch. Also, um, as we all know, the Lord Regent is a shriveled prick. This is this is a really important piece of graffiti because it actually reveals the spirit of the city. And um, when I started this sentence, it was going to be a joke. I was going to do a bit about, um, <laughs> uh, you know, like artistically analyzing this piece of graffiti, but straight up, it actually does. Graffiti in a city reflects the spirit of that city. It shows how the people in the city are feeling. It shows the um, sentiment of the city as a space and um, how they feel about their leadership, their rulers, any hardships they might be undergoing. So the extent of the graffiti in the city is um, an unambiguous sign as to, you know, the mood of the city, what's going on, how how people are feeling. Now see, that sculpture I could have critiques of. In fact, maybe I will on my way back. Regardless, it's time to do some very unethical BDSM. Finally, I've been like this for 20 minutes. Your footsteps sound a little loud. Have you gained a little weight, Bunny? Rude. Not just like last time, understand? Slowly, and only trigger the shock at my command. Get it? And the safe word tonight will be retribution, I'd say. You hear that, you stop. One shock out of line, and you are out of a job. So, this, um, this setup here betrays a complete misunderstanding of the dynamics and, like, the way that BDSM tends to work. And uh, also a complete betrayal of consent dynamics, of course, which is a huge problem, but let's not get into it right now, because after all, Corvo is not a Kingston. Oh, 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 that's good. I deserve that one. Shall I tell you why? The Pendletons are here, right? I'll start with them. I cheated them. Robbed them of thousands. Cool. Um, but, like... I say that glibly, but like straight up, he's just like, well, sure, I don't see anything ethically wrong with shocking this guy. Oh, Although he does want you to shock him. Back. I'll tell you everything. The Pendleton's inheritance was worth hundreds of thousands at least. I told them it was junk. So if you think about it, we haven't actually breached consent yet. Ah, ah, retribution! Retribution! Ah, that was perfect. But it's all I can take for tonight. Call my servants. We're done. Like, this guy must have very, very particular and very, very specific kinks going on. He doesn't want to interact with you in any way. All he wants to know is that a human being can hear him tell his secrets, um, and ostensibly will be forcing him to do so. But, like, with no other 
component to it. You could put this on a timer and it would be exactly the same experience for this guy. Ah, we're done, I said. Retribution. Now let me out. Definitely we're in ethical grey areas now. What the Who is this? What do you want? The safe, yes of course. The combination is 138. Take anything you find. I think I felt my heart skip. So, um, if you're playing High Chaos, you can continue to shock him until he dies. Which is not what we're gonna do. Because, hey, I've actually managed not to kill anyone on this part of this chapter so far. Ever since we came to the Golden Cat, I have... I don't believe I've killed anyone. Correct me if I'm lying. Um, but yeah, so that's an interesting little aside. I'm sure he'll be, he'll be fine. Next, we'll head down into the steam room in the basement. The steam room is the um, second pre-programmed kill mechanic where you don't have to actually set up your own things you can just deal with them I really I kind of I'm in two minds I really want to talk about the intentional way that the kind of like tragic tawdry nature of the lives of these women is set up and how that that is both valid given the circumstances presented within the narrative but also feeds into a great deal of uh pre-existing cultural assumptions and associations and so on with sex work as a whole rather than sex work as a structure constructed to extract value from people who have no control over it. What are they going to do? Looks like they're going to gamble and drink every night till it's gone, then jump in the river. I talked over that, but that's a little bit of exposition about the trouble the Pendletons are having. Turns out their silver mine is almost, almost dried up. But yeah, so I don't. But the thing is, I also don't want to be a super downer. I don't really want to go into talking about like the misery of sex trafficking on this, my fun YouTube channel where I talk about video games. <laughs> However, this does reflect the way in which everything is political. There is there is nothing in this world that is not political in some way. Um, because the fact that this reproduces those. Um, cultural assumptions itself is is very telling. Um, it bespeaks something of the, you know, unthinking politics of the people who made this the game. state that the conservative position gets an extra three votes. But not in the month of timber. Is that true? How on earth do you know that? Did you think I was born a courtesan, Lord Pendleton? I was a clerk to Lord Estermont before. Whatever happened to old Estermont? The rats did. An old sewer line led under his office in Parliament, and one day it flooded, and they all came rushing out. They say the other lords barricaded him in to save themselves. The screams lasted hours. He begged and called them by name, but they let him die. So, um, Pendleton getting at, let's just call this a hand job here, kind of brings me to another point, which is that games are, as an art form, very willing to show some kinds of, um, you know, unacceptable, uh, you know, taboo stuff. However, they're very unwilling to show other stuff. Games are incredibly prudish. Games will happily be vastly violent. This game it is incredibly violent. We've seen me do all kinds of terrible things in the um, high chaos mode. However, games are unwilling to be sexual. Almost across the board, mainstream games simply do not have sex in them, they do not have nudity in them, they do not have sexuality in them even. Um, except in very kind of boring, tawdry ways. And this is just curious to me. I mean, I understand completely why it happens, but it also reflects this sort of vast cultural puritanism, and is an absolute and unambiguous double standard. So, um... Here we have a brothel. It is very much a brothel. That's what it's for. That's what it, the point of it is. And, um... Well, uh... I'll continue that in a moment if I remember to. But first... I'm gonna waste the last of my bolts. Hope I don't need any of those anytime soon. 
I did think there would be more bolts laying around in this place, but apparently not. Anyway, this guy can drown. Because fuck him, he's awful. Ah, shit, I forgot to use the heart on him. God damn it. Oh well. The courtesan, of course, does not deserve any kind of horrible treatment. I say smashing her head against a uh, stone altar, but that was unintentional. There's a number of ways to get around in here. You can turn into a rat if you have possession. You can also possess the fish and use this vent to get through into that room and then... <laughs> uh, just imagine you're standing there getting a lovely hand massage from a nice young woman in the steam room and then suddenly there's a loud splashing noise as a large bedraggled man in an extremely ugly mask pops out of nowhere to um, shoot you in the face. Anyway, um, the built-in kill method here is that you overload the crank, the steam builds up in there and they are boiled to death. However, that involves murdering the courtesan as well, which I think is kind of unfair. She, it's just her job, she's just here. That is collateral damage and we are not here for it, even when we do feel the need to kill people. So uh, instead of that, I prefer to take this method where there's a lot of people doing drugs in this bordello. Like, it is not that unlikely that um, someone might slip beneath the water in a drugged stupor. Now these two are here. Actually, I'm, I'm going to take them out. It needs to be not when these two women are watching. So these two spawn in, I think, after you make your first kill. I'm pretty sure it's consistent that it's always after the first kill. Spread out. There's been word of a ruckus. No details yet. Even if nobody actually hears you do anything, even if you've completely ghosted it, these two still show up and say the sign of a ruckus, which it's whatever, but okay. Why did the other guy go? There he is, okay. So I do keep saying that um, stopping time will solve every problem, and that is just simply true. Stopping time lets you abduct people with perf like perfect stealth, unless you fuck up and drop them like I just did. Um, they make it very easy to completely vanish people. That's kind of precarious. Um, the ethics of a dude pile are beyond my, my scope. So I'm just going to trust that they'll all wake up and, and not uh, throw each other off the ledge like uh, rats in a bucket. I thought he was about to start pissing. I can... Actually, you know what? I'm just going to leave this guy here. I've explored everywhere else. There's not much else to do. But, um, yeah, so games do have this this curious double standard where they um, are perfectly happy to show extreme violence, but very, very unwilling to show sexuality, even in a place that is built for sexuality. I don't know. <laughs> Shit. Well, okay. I mean, I'm not sure how they can tell I wasn't just another customer. Like, people probably turn up in this place with their, uh, you know, with, with masks on or whatever, because it's a brothel and people are embarrassed about it. So uh, I'm going to cut here and catch up to where I was. So I have taken a safer route to get to the surface, uh, not the surface, the top. Instead of coming up the central staircase like some kind of just idiot, um, I have gone around the outside and climbed up the balconies to the second story, a much safer way of getting up here. So this is the smoking room, which is another one of the potential rooms that you can find the Pendletons in. We know he's not in here, but it's still worth looking around. Also, um, I will mention that one of the reasons I'm being sneaky even when I'm in these rooms is um, the guard behavior. They actually have a unique behavior up here, which is that they will peek through the peepholes. They will look through the keyholes in the hope of catching... Well, we've just established that uh, this is a weirdly chased brothel because games are incredibly chased, but tell me what you want. The high overseer for all I care. I've never been this drunk. Some of my friends say I look like Lady Boyle. Everly? That look like trauma. If I'd found those crystal deposits on my estate, I'd be throwing parties too. I'd be buying the Lord Regent's favor too instead of begging for money from my cousins. I didn't mean to upset you, my <laughs> Yep, I forgot that these guys, that um, whenever one of the Pendletons is in one of the, the external rooms, they will path to the balcony occasionally, which is very useful to me. They move around in the rooms, so sometimes they come out and hang out on the balcony.
Right, I might have time now to... Nope. So I would have really, really liked to use the heart on these guys. Unfortunately... So she's scared because he vanished, but um, that's all she's seen. Two drownings on the same night. I hope the reputation can recover. Now, I don't think she I saw me. I am going to take care of her just uh, on general principles because an alerted civilian is generally a bad idea to have around. Yeah, see, there's no uh, there's no knockout darts around here. This is really unfortunate. So that is basically the last of the cat. As you can see, there is a there is a top level of the rondel here. Um, but there's very little in there to get. There's a couple of quite valuable items that you can pick up lying around, but there's about four or five guards walking around. It's quite a difficult area to get through if you don't go around the outside like I have. Um, so I'm actually just going to skip that entire zone because it's just, it's not a good scene. So uh, the reason why I wanted to be able to use the heart on one of the Pendletons is that I believe that is where we have the only mention of a, a slavery trade extant in the game. And I think that's inter interesting. Will he wake up if I disturb her? What's the matter with you? For reasons that I talked about previously, about how it's kind of disingenuous uh, for a game set during this particular era to make no mention of the existence of slavery essentially as an institution because this era of history only came into existence due to the existence of the triangle trade in the north atlantic as i said before one of the greatest sins to have existed in human history was was the creation and proliferation of that trade um but it was also fundamentally it had a major effect on the societies that instituted it and profited from it so um i think that if you want to say we're just not going to touch that question. We're going to pretend that this world came into its came into its this state. Um, regardless, it happened because of different reasons. Whatever, I'm okay with that. What I find curious about this game, what I dis find that I disapprove of in this game, is that they imply that that's the case. There's just no mention of it ever. But there's a couple of hints that the Pendletons are engaging in slavery, and it's just. It feels like almost trying to have your cake and eat it, but in a really dumb, bad way. Uh, because you simply have... You you gesture at its existence and then pretend that it wasn't some kind of major societal force. It's, it's almost historical revisionism to some extent, and I find it really distasteful. I've, um, I've stated this more eloquently to... While, while like, working out my, my notes and things and discussing with some friends, but, like... I think it's a problem and I think it's a mistake. Either elide it completely and just pretend that this world, that's not a question you want to talk about in this world, or actually have it centred as an issue. Um, acknowledge the the abominable reality of it um, to at least some more of an extent. Instead, it's just kind of like other people brush it aside and say, oh, I've, I've heard they I've heard they use slavery, which is it's kind of distasteful, but whatever, you know? Um, or the heart tells you that they use slavery, and that's just... It, like, if if it's not something they're allowed to do in this world, if it's not something they're encouraged to do, why have they not been stopped, you know? Um, at the very least, not by other aristocratic families who seem dis to at least have distaste for it. Like, does this world have an abolition movement? Um, you know, are there, like, is this a multiracial society? Is the slave trade in this setting racialized? That's a very important question that they completely refuse to acknowledge. Um, so anyway, second downer aside of these two episodes aside, let's go talk to Emily. Let's go. Let's get out of here. This place is on the river, so you must have come by boat. I'll wait for you near the boat. I remember the way. Don't worry about me. Uh, so this is another example of these weirdly common, very low-key plot holes. There are tons of plot holes in Dishonored, but for some reason all of them are very small and very specific and localised. It's very much like, oh, you must have come here by river, therefore I 
I couldn't tell exactly which random spot you must have, have, have parked your boat at. That doesn't make any sense. Like, this district has hundreds of meters of riverside. Um, and even then, like, there's more than one boatman in the city. There's no reason why there might be multiple boats there. It's very strange that she would just be like that. It's, it's, um, the intention is to just brush aside the question. Did I forget, uh... Did I forget one of these? That's actually quite an important question. I need to go back no, and no, check. Don't take it. And we're back. So, um, yeah, no, it was fine. Actually, I was worrying about nothing, which is something I do a lot of sometimes. Anyway, um, we're nearly done with this chapter now. So I'm going to go take care of the one final thing I want to do, namely rob the absolute bejesus out of bunting. I believe I visited this building before. I don't think I cleared it out. And here we have a lovely little dude pile. Uh, so yeah, here we are in Bunting's apartment. I can't remember if I talked about this previously, but it, this is a fucking mess. The way that uh, the people at the cat talk about it and the way Slackjaw talk about it implies that this art dealer's apartment is... He's still living here? That is a trade that is fundamentally reliant on um, appearances and on the nobility sort of semi-trusting that you're one of them because you can keep up appearances and so on. If this is his gallery, why is it ruined like this? I think this must be- this is another one of these odd little inconsistencies where it's like, okay, so they designed this to be an abandoned apartment and then later on decided to actually have Bunting be an NPC who exists in the world and is still running around doing art dealing stuff. He was just gloating about how much money he made by tricking the Pendletons out of their inheritance and yet look at this place. There's no way he is showing um, noblemen around here trying to sell them portraits. So um, here we have Light Along the Inverse Curve, which is Sokolov's famous self-portrait. One of the really interesting things about Sokolov's self-portrait is that he intentionally shows himself to be quite simian. I think that there is a very intentional uh, contrast between the kind of almost ape-like appearance that Sokolov gives to himself. He has no... Um, he does not flatter himself. He depicts himself quite unflatteringly, in fact. He does not go for a direct realism. He chooses to exaggerate himself um, in an unflattering way to represent possibly how he feels about himself, which is a very obvious take, or possibly how he feels about the existence of his art and himself as a genius in this world. Here we have a total contrast between his appearance and his capabilities. We also have a contrast between the bestialness of his appearance and the delicacy with which he holds his brush. So we have this contrast between how the man appears and what the true value of the man is. His value is in his hands, his value is in his mind, the th subtle things and the invisible things. Um, so I think that this represents a kind of like a deeper truth that Sokolov, Sokolov wants to represent about himself. Notice also, one of his eyes is focused on the portrait, but the other eye is ambiguous. Is he working on his portrait, or is he glaring up at you in, in disapproval at you having interrupted him? Notice also the lack of a background. Um, he is clearly completely focused within his world. There is one thing that exists to Sokolov, and it is his current portrait. It is his current work, it is his current painting, his current design. This is a man who lives for his work, whose only focus is on the things that he produces with his hands. Again, the focus on the hands reinforces this. So there's actually two more Sokolov portraits here, if I remember correctly. I think they're all in this area. There's also two more guys up here. Unfortunately, I'm out of knockout bolts, so I might not be able to take them both out non lethally. They wouldn't have such a strong door unless they kept some interesting things on its other side. I'm telling you, it won't budge. Not even a bit. And I think I bruised out my shoulder. Stop your crying and give another shove. Just imagine what could be behind it. That'll get you through the pain. If you're so sure, then you shove it. So if they separate out, which they clearly are, I might be able to pull this off. Why do people tear them? Fantastic. So this is the ideal. Um, this is how I try and play all of the time, but unfortunately one of the th interesting things about Let's Playing is that I discovered that um, 
talking occupies like two thirds of my mental bandwidth. If I am speaking, I am very, very, very bad at um, managing to like pull off clever things. Or if I'm pulling off clever things, I forget to speak. So um, I am actually like, for all that I get nice comments where people say, oh wow, you're way better at this game than me. Like, bruh, trust me, I am even better than you think. So we do actually have his, um, his, uh, where is it? Here we go, 138. Same as the, uh, no wait, hang on. Also, um, I mentioned previously that there's only one bookcase in the game, and um, this is another example of that uh, labour saving. This is the same door as is on the, um, on the safes in the game, except it's upscaled and detached and put here. They only designed one door, they only modelled it once, it only exists once in the game's data files. These kind of tricks are very common in game design and I think it's completely fine for them to do it, but it is really endearing to me how common it is in this game and it's also quite, um... See again, this is the statue that was featured in the, uh, in the Golden Cat. I believe that's the only place here and there that it's seen. Is there something else? Nope, never. There's nothing else lying around either. Um, so, yeah, I think this is really cool. I think that there's um, a lot to be said for this kind of design. I think it saves time, and I think it's a fun, a fun moment for me as a player when I spot them. So we're running over time a little bit, so I'm gonna have to hurry the fuck up. Here we have the portrait of the Pendleton boys. Now, one of the things that I think is interesting about this portrait in particular is the way that. Um, the, there is a splitting of painting styles between the two twins here and uh, the third brother, Trevor, in the background. So with the two frontal brothers, we have a very traditional portrait style. They're very carefully posed. Um, they are posed in positions which uh, also dictate to us, the viewer, their um, relative personalities. We have the central dominant figure. We have the calculating hand gesture. We have the malevolent stare directly into the, the viewer's eyes. We have the second brother, who adopts the attitude of a, uh, a loyal lieutenant, a skilled second, second in command who is willing to follow his brother everywhere. But this also presents them as having a very united front. Notice also that they have very similar lapels, whereas um, Trevor does not. These two, uh, it's not just that they are similar in appearance because they are twins, they are similar in attitude, they are similar in behaviour, they are similar in malevolence. They, um, they are given these particular facial expressions and kind of like arrogant swaggering poses that cause them to dominate the frame. On the other hand, here we have Trevor. Trevor is depicted in a much more um, verite style. Trevor is depicted as if he has just wandered into the frame of a photograph. Custis and Morgan are posed. They are clearly standing for this portrait. Trevor looks as if he's wandered in here, he looks as if he's in motion, he is passing through this space, he is not welcome, he was not invited, he is not a part of this. These are the people who are important. This is an afterthought. So this reflects very much the attitudes of these brothers, which we can, you know, we know that how these brothers have treated each other and how they feel about each other thanks to um, Pendleton's audio logs in the, uh, in the the pub that we keep returning to between missions, so it's nice to see that Sokolov himself could um, observe these relationships between these brothers himself when he was doing these portraits. So finally, here we have Dowd and the Parabola... Parab blah, 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 blah. Here we finally have Dowd and the Parabola, Parabola of Lost Seasons. This is a much more heroic portrait than the other ones we see. Rather than traditional portraiture or um, a more verite style where we see a, a kind of like real social... Uh, you know, a, a, a realism depicted, what we have here is a very strong figure, almost heroically exaggerated. He stands um, almost in a manner appropriate to a superhero, uh, which is something that obviously is from an art form that arrives much later in, in you know, history, and the history of Donwall does mirror our own to some extent. But of course, Dowd is an assassin, Dowd is a monster, he is a murderer and a witch and a sacrificer of peoples. And yet, we have this noble gaze, he stares off to the horizon, therefore he's clearly a man of vision. He is clearly part of the city. Unlike many of Sokolov's portraits, his background is defined. One of the most important things about him is his context. He is Dunwall. 
he is this place. And yet, his grasping hand betrays a slightly sinister angle hidden beneath this upper layer of, um, upper layer of initial heroism. I believe that Sokolov admires this man and fears this man. And here's the interesting thing. Who posed for this? We know that Sokolov does not like to work without a, um, a model. So, how did Sokolov manage to paint a portrait of Dowd, famously ghostly assassin who, who is, you know, legendary in the city and, and very rarely actually seen? Nobody really knows what Dowd looks like. He's, he's a teleporting assassin who wears hooded clothes all of the time. But, as we will find out later, this is exactly what Dowd looks like. Is there a, perhaps a secret connection between Sokolov and Dowd? Or are the, um, you know, void-inspired painting skills of Sokolov perhaps reaching through this luminiferous ether connecting the two of them in some spiritual way through the spiritual plane that they can both to some extent perceive? Anyway, uh, that's... Yeah. <laughs> so that should be all of the portraits here. Actually, there is a little bit of stuff downstairs. I don't believe that there are there is anything actually to steal down there, but for some reason there is a rat swarm hiding. So this super looks like a treasure room. Under the kind of the rules of the game as we understand it, places like this are where lootable objects are hidden. However, if you break in there, all you will find is a rat swarm attacking you. I don't know if there was supposed to be some kind of useful item in there and um, they simply forgot to add it, or if this is an intentional joke on the part of the designers, but it does amuse me a great deal. Also, God, I love the crunching sound effect. I, I cannot get enough of it. Let's not go out through the front door since we will be murdered by policemen. Um, aha, here we go, the side exit. Fortunately, we saved that woman a couple episodes ago, and she has given us the key so we can get out here. Now, I'm going to uh, skedaddle, and I'll catch up with you in a second. Hey, sweetie, I'm glad to see you made it here okay. Is she being alright for you, Sam? Is she being a good girl? Fantastic. Let's get the hell out of here. Are you both ready to go? Corvo, you must have worked wonders out there in the city tonight. I can't believe my old eyes. Right, hostiles killed four. Dead or unconscious bodies found two. Chaos low. This is going fine. And as you can see, I found all of the secret thingamajigs. So you did the business, did you, Corvo? I'm not one to speak against my betters, mind you, but if anybody ever deserved their fate, it was those Pendletons. What business are you talking about? Oh, I, uh... Grown-up business, girl. I mean, your ladyship. Forgive me. It's okay. I heard a lot of grown up business at the Golden Cat. Oh. I should concentrate on piloting this boat. I love that little smile. Young Lady Emily, I'm Callista. I'll be caring for you and schooling you while you're with us. Pleased to meet you. As am I. Would you like to see your room in the tower? Can I see it? Yes, you may. You'll get to see it all. The entirety of the Hound Pits. Good. I think I'll like it here. I'll go with Callista, Corvo. I'll see you later. You do not fail to impress. Armed with a blade, you've changed the course of the city forever. And with the Pendleton twins gone, our own Lord Pendleton will assume their votes in Parliament. In one night, you've done more than most men do in a lifetime. I need to speak to you soon. But for now, Lord Pendleton requests your attention. Yeah, well, he's gonna have to wait just like everybody else, because that is all for today. I, uh, this episode ran long a little bit, that was because unfortunately it didn't uh, divide up very good, but I didn't want to have like five minutes of that last mission before running back here. Um, so just to cap off this episode, I will mention again, as you can see, the river very much has this, uh, you know, you can tell where you are. We are much closer to that tower on the horizon, the clock tower now. Gazing down the river, we can see Caldwin's Bridge. 
We can also see a broken bridge, which might be a second broken bridge, but all of these places make sense in relation to one another. Anyway, that's besides the point, which is that uh, normally I would zip through this area and get ready for the next mission as well. However, I'll do that next episode because we've already run massively over time. Thank you so much for watching. I hope you enjoyed this. Catch you later. If you like this, you can also follow me on Twitter for updates, stream announcements, and one tweet micro reviews, or why not donate to me via Patreon or Ko-fi or just share my work. Thank you so much for watching.